This is a training for learning how to use LabScribe. LabScribe is the software that you will be using to run your iWorks systems. It can be downloaded from our website at www.iworks.com. When you first open LabScribe, this is the screen that you will see. Um, it will show some graphs and they will all say raw channel. This is not currently set up to record any data from a lab. So the first thing that you need to do is go into settings and choose a lab that you would like to do. I generally like to show everybody how to do an ECG. So I'm going to go to human heart and then exercise ECG circulation. Once that is chosen, a couple of different things are going to happen. One of the first things that happens is that you will get a PDF of a set of directions that will show you how to connect everything together. Our directions are both in text and with various images to show you exactly what needs to be connected so that you can perform the correct experiment. The other thing that happens is the screen will change. So now, rather than having four random graphs, you have graphs specific to recording ECG pulse, and in this case, heart rate. Our graphs are color-coded. Anything with a blue graph background bar means that the data being recorded on these channels are live, coming directly from your subject. And a light green background bar means that the data being recorded on this channel will be calculated from your subject's other channels. In this case, we are calculating a heart rate from the pulse graph. You will notice that there are titles to each of the graphs over on the left side of the screen. Filtering, if you are filtering a um, biopotential recording like ECG, EMG, EOG, electro something o grams will always have a filter. And that way you are filtering out the signal that you do not want and keeping the signal that you do want. So in this case, we would be filtering out anything that is not an ECG signal. It will also tell you the connector and where on the TA or whatever box you are using. So in this case, our pulse sensor is, has a DIN 8 connector on it and it is plugged into channel five. Our heart rate graph is being calculated as a rate from the pulse channel. All of that information is contained right here next to the title. Staying on the left side of the screen, you will see sampling speed. Sampling speed is how much data are being collected every second. This can range anywhere from five samples per second to hundreds of thousands of samples per second, depending on what you are recording. This is set for you when you choose the lab and you don't need to worry about it. The other thing that you will see on the left side of the screen is your display time. Your display time corresponds to your X axis, which would be down here at the bottom of your screen. The X axis is time, hence display time. So what this is basically telling you is how much data you are seeing on the screen based on what you have recorded. So if I caught record three minutes of data and my display time is set for 10 seconds, then I am only seeing a 10 second snapshot of that three minutes of data. You can alter your display time very easily by highlighting and typing in whatever you want your display time to be. 
So now my display time is 15 seconds. And if you look down on the X axis, you can see that there is a 15 second time span. There are other ways to change your display time, which I will show you when we start recording some data. Continuing on the left, you will see that we have a plus, a double-headed arrow, a minus, and this FX button on each of our graphs. The plus button alters your Y axis by zooming in. So this will make your Y axis more accurate. The minus button does the opposite and zooms out and makes your Y axis less accurate. The auto scale button, which is the double headed arrow in the magnifying glass, is your Goldilocks button. Basically, when you click this, it automatically fixes the amplitude of your trace to the correct Y axis value. You will be using the auto scale buttons all the time. So to make it easy, rather than having to click auto scale, auto scale, and auto scale, we have an auto scale all button pretty much right in the center of the computer screen um, on our toolbar of icons. So this is the auto scale all button. It will automatically scale your data in each graph all at the same time. The FX button is a very, very powerful button because this will allow you to create any additional calculated graphs that you want. Notice that each graph has its own FX button, which means that if I wanted to do a calculation from my ECG, I could calculate periodic information, rates, frequencies, periods, etc. I could calculate an integral, derivatives, spirometric data. I could create my own channel math, et cetera, et cetera. This is an advanced feature. So if you are just recording with your students in class, 99% of the time you will never need the FX button. However, if your students are doing specific research projects and they want to make additional channels, it is very easy to create one. So I'm just gonna create a periodic rate graph from my ECG graph. So I'm gonna click FX, periodic, and then rate, and it will create a new graph and it will ask you to make sure you're getting your timing from the right channel. And it'll give you a baseline to start with of how to set your threshold and tolerance. Just click okay for here. You will notice now our new graph that was created doesn't have a title. It is very easy to give a graph a title. Just click on the name and type in whatever you want your title to be. In this case, I'm going to call it heart rate ECG and say OK. That way I'm distinguishing between my heart rate channel for my pulse graph and my heart rate channel from my ECG graph. This was really just to show you how easy it is to add another graph. Um, and you can delete any calculated channels at any point in time by right clicking in the graph and then clicking delete. And now I'm back to my original screen. So we have discussed sampling speed, altering your display time, the channel titles or graph titles, and your ability to alter your Y axis and change or add any calculated graphs that you would like. I'm now gonna move over to the right side of the screen. And when you look on the right side of the screen, this is where you are going to get mathematical information out of the data that you have recorded. This is based on moving these red cursors the cursor on the left side is always cursor one. The cursor on the right side is always cursor two. So you never have to remember which cursor is which. These values are based on the positioning of the cursors on the graph in the particular window. 
time is based on the information between the two cursors along the x-axis. That is your elapsed time between the two cursors or your duration. And then for your y-axis, v2 minus v1, think v for vertical. This is the amplitude difference between the cursors. This allows you to get amplitudes of ECG waves, like the amplitude of a P wave or the QRS complex or the T wave. You can also figure out amplitudes of EMG signals, a pulse signal, anything that has a change in height. My pulse graph also is an amplitude difference. But if you look down here to the heart rate graph, I am now collecting a mean rather than amplitude difference. I don't really need to see the difference in height of my pulse graph, but it would be really nice to know what my average pulse was while I was doing a certain experiment. So this is set for mean. These are automatically set for you when you open up a lab, but if you would like to change it, all you need to do is click and you can change it to amplitude difference, the value at your left-hand cursor, the value at your right-hand cursor, the max, the min, the mean, or the max minus min between the cursors. The other features are more advanced features that will be needed in very specific labs and the directions for using those are in those labs. So this is just what you are going to interact with when you first open up the software. Again, your PDF document is going to open so that it will show you and give you directions on how to plug everything in. And the software sets itself up automatically for that particular lab that you have chosen. Now, you can also get additional documentation by clicking the experiment tab. This will give you an introduction to the chapters. So all of these are different chapters. So human exercise is a chapter, human heart is a chapter, human spirometry is a chapter, animal nerve is a chapter. So an introduction is just going to be an introduction to the specific labs in the chapter. This is good information for you as an instructor, but I might not give it to my students. Background information is specific to the lab itself. This is definitely information I would give to my students as it explains what we are going to be doing in the lab itself. Um, it's usually a very short um, blurb of information ranging anywhere from one to two pages. Sometimes there are diagrams and things in the background that are helpful for students to have. And last and most importantly is the lab itself. So when you open up the lab itself, it will bring you to a set of specific directions to carry out the lab that you chose. Every lab that iWorks has is written in the same in quotes language. So as your students move through using these labs, they will become easier and easier for the student to zip through the lab without struggling with any of the directions. Generally, exercise one in all of our labs is either a resting state or a baseline. And it doesn't take very long to do this first experiment. Most of our first experiments take approximately 15 minutes. Now, the nice thing is the directions are very simple. No matter what lab you choose, no matter what experiment you are doing, our directions are the same. You are going to click record to begin recording data. Once you start recording data, you should click the auto scale button. And remember, you're gonna use the auto scale all button and that will auto scale. 
and make the signal look nice in all of the graphs. This is just some troubleshooting information. If it isn't looking nice, you might have to play around a little bit, but generally you should never have to do this. This is just here, just in case. When you have a nice graph, you can annotate your graph. And this requires using something called the mark button. I will talk about that as we start collecting some data. Once you have collected your data, click stop, and then always save your data. And we suggest saving either on the desktop or in a documents folder. And that way you always know where you've saved your data. Saving is just as important with LabScribe data as it is when you're writing something in Word or doing something in PowerPoint or Excel. You always want to save your information. Once you are done with the exercise, depending on the lab, it might have you go directly to a second exercise or it will take you to a section of data analysis. All of our labs show images of what your data are supposed to look like so that you'll know right away if you are collecting the correct data. And then that brings us to data analysis. Data analysis is the way you are going to get the mathematical information out of those pretty pictures that you have just recorded. So all of those nice signals that you have recorded on the screen, you are now going to analyze. Data analysis is as simple as moving the cursors from peak to peak, trough to trough, and the directions are stated step by step we also have a picture of our icon toolbar so that students know exactly where to click based on the directions below. I would suggest you can make a um, print out a copy of this and laminate it, and you can tape it right to your iWorks box. And that way, students always have access to what these buttons mean right in front of them if they forget to look in their lab. I know that sometimes students don't like to read. These would be the directions for doing specific measurements in this particular lab. We tell you what we want you to measure, in this case, our wave amplitude, and then how to measure it. Place one cursor on Q, and then the one cursor on the peak of the R and look at V2 minus V1. And we go through and tell you all the different measurements. And just in case you might be confused or your students are confused, we have a really nice diagram of the ECG waves for students to be able to understand where the labels are. Once the students have done all of their data analysis, there is a set of questions that students should be able to answer at the experiment. The questions are not only in the lab, but they are also right here in the actual software. Um, I clicked the journal tab, which is the tab that looks like the notebook. And you can see that all of our exercises um, and questions for those exercises are right here in the actual lab. And students can type right in here and answer the question if you so choose. And I'm just gonna close that journal for now. Okay, so we have discussed sampling speed, display time, the individual graphs and graph controls, how to move the cursors, how to read time, amplitude difference, and mean values. That now brings me to all of my icons. And some of these icons are better explained when I have recorded data. Other icons can be explained easily right now. So we're gonna talk about those icons first and then we'll go ahead and record some data. 
new file. This will create an exact file of what you've already got on the screen. I hesitate using this because if your students made a mistake or did something weird that you cannot figure out, if you click File New, it will actually keep whatever errors are in there. I always suggest that if you ever need to reload the lab, always come into Settings and re-choose the lab from the list. And this will start you from square one, clean slate, no errors. Opening a saved file. Once you save your file, you may want to open it at a later time. You can either use the open file or this information is under the file menu. And this is the save your data file. You always wanna save your data. Like I said, just like Word or Excel or PowerPoint, you always want to save your information. That brings me to the rest of these fun little icons. And some of these icons we will be talking about while we are doing data collection. Other icons we can talk about now. And really the only two other icons I wanna talk about right now are the record and preview buttons. The preview button allows you to preview your recording so you can make sure that your electrodes are on correctly that the subject understands how to breathe, that the signal you are recording is correct, but it will not actually do a soft save of your data. Clicking the record button is what allows you to soft save your data so that when you click stop, this lovely red circle turns into a black square that says stop. And once you do that, it will create a buffer file and then you can hard save your data so that you can open it at a later time. Do not confuse the preview and record buttons. It is definitely always better to record. I even record to check and make sure my electrodes are fine. That way I don't have any chance of accidentally losing all in quotes all of my data because I was just in preview mode. Okay, now that I have discussed that, I'm actually going to um, pull up a file so that I can show you how to collect data. So please bear with me as I get this set up. And this is just some technical stuff which is going to allow me to um, record some data with you. And we are going to record an ECG and pulse. And here is my lab all set up. But you'll notice that my display time is three seconds. Remember how easy it is to change display time. I'm just going to change that to 15. My ECG is set. My pulse is set. Oh, my heart rate graph isn't named. Remember how easy it is to name a graph. Just click on the title and type in the graph name and click OK. Now let's double check and make sure everything is set for what we want to do with our recording. We have our V2 minus V1 amplitude on our ECG, which is what I want. Amplitude for my pulse waves, which is what I want. However, my heart rate says V2 minus V1. Remember, one click, choose mean, all set and ready to go. So now I can start my experiment. And I'm going to just do a resting recording. It is always a good idea to annotate your recording so you know what is happening when. So I have typed resting in the mark box to get ready and I'm going to give it a name of my subject. So I'm just gonna call this subject one. So this is resting data from subject one. I'm going to click record and click the mark button and you will notice a black line on the recording screen that says resting subject one. So I know that all of the data from this point forward is while my subject is resting. So I'm gonna record 20 or 30 seconds or so of my subject resting. And then perhaps I'm going to ask my subject to do an experiment. So the experiment that I am gonna ask my subject to do is a simple one. 
I'm going to ask them to hold their breath. So I'm going to type hold breath in here and click the mark button. And I'm going to have my subject hold their breath for as long as they can. And while they're holding their breath, I'm going to type breathe normally here so that when they let their breath out, I can mark the recording so that I know that my subject is breathing normally. And I'm gonna let them breathe normally for another 20 seconds or so. Notice it's scrolling across the screen and everything looks very nice. I'm gonna let them do this recording. And then when I'm done, I'm going to click stop. And now would be the time where I would save my data. So I would do file save. It's going to ask me where I want to save my file. I'll go ahead and save that to my desktop, give it a name, and save it so I'm ready to go. I can continue recording on this file, and I don't have to open up a new file to keep going. The only time I would open up a new file is if I change subjects or it's a new lab period. Otherwise, I could continue with my same subject on this particular file. Now you'll notice that when I did this, everything looked perfect, okay? However, sometimes your data might not look perfect. It might come out really small. And so if my data look like this while I'm recording, remember you can use this miraculous auto scale all button and it will auto scale all of my channels at the same time. Occasionally, you may have to auto scale your calculated channel, but most of the time, the auto scale all button will work on everything. The other thing that you can do, either while you're recording or after you are recording, is alter your display time. The one way to alter your display time, remember, is to type in the display time box. The other way to alter your display times are by clicking the half display time button, which is the single mountain. You'll notice it went from 10 seconds to five seconds. If I click it again, it goes to two and a half seconds. And you can click it again and again and again. Your students may do this accidentally. If they do, check your display time and highlight it and fix it. Okay, very easy. Nothing happened to their data other than it looked really funny because you were looking at milliseconds of data rather than seconds of data. The other thing you can do is double your display time. Doubling your display time is very easy. You just click the two mountain peaks and this will give you all of your data. You can double the display time quite a lot you will notice that I have doubled my display time to the entire data collection. And this is one minute, 13 and a half seconds approximately. It is accurate, by the way, to three decimal places, so that is correct. You will notice that when I do that, it's not very pretty. Like it's gonna be very difficult for me to do any mathematical collection on this data because all of my um, waves are very close together. So one of the other ways you can alter your display time is by moving the cursors to a specific location and clicking the zoom between cursor button. And I'm just gonna auto scale this so everything looks nice and pretty. And now I have a nice recording. I can analyze my data by moving my cursors around. So if I want to get, let's say my P wave amplitude, I would go from P to Q and measure V2 minus V1. That will give me my P wave amplitude. R wave amplitude, go from peak of R, and you will notice I have a little hash mark on my cursor and I get that hash mark right where it belongs. And I'm gonna take this one and put it down at the bottom. If you wanna get it perfectly exact, you can use your right and left arrow keys on your keyboard. And then you would measure, since I'm measuring amplitude, I would look over and read V2 minus V1. This is not probably very accurate for measuring 
heart rate because I'm only measuring 28 milliseconds between my cursors. So I'm going to double my display time. And now I'm going to spread my cursors out so they are 10 seconds apart. Again, you can get this perfectly accurate by using your right and left arrow keys. I'm at 10 seconds. And now when I look, my mean heart rate is 69.7 beats per minute. So all of this data is being collected by just manipulating the cursors and putting them on the waves or on the trace so that you can get the values that you are looking for. Now, I made annotations of my recording so that I knew what my subject was doing during this experiment. It is always a good idea to mark or annotate your recording so that you know when something is happening. It's no good if you have your um, student do an entire experiment and they don't remember that they were supposed to mark the recording every minute after they came back to exercise to find out how long it took them to recover. So marking the recording is pretty important. We did that by typing in the mark box and pressing the mark button. There is a small arrow just to the right of the mark button. And if you click it, here are all of my annotations. So if I want to go to the section where my subject was holding their breath, I could just click that mark. So let's do that. And notice, boom, right in the center of the screen, I am now to the section of data where my subject started holding their breath but I can't see where they ended. So I have two methods for doing that. I can either scroll using the scroll bar on the bottom of the screen, or I can use my double um, mountain peaks to double my display time. And now I can see um, how long my subject held their breath for. So we can measure this. So let's put one cursor on the hold breath mark and we'll move the other cursor to the breathe normally bar mark. And my subject held their breath for approximately 15.6 seconds and their mean heart rate was 71.4 beats per minute. I can scroll back over to the beginning of the recording and we can look at what the subject's heart rate was before they started holding their breath. And I'm gonna keep my cursor set for that same 15.6 seconds apart so that I don't have another variable. So my subject's heart rate, roughly 69, or I can scroll over to get this higher peak, 71 beats per minute. So I know my subject's heart rate before the experiment was about 71 beats per minute. While they did the experiment, we had measured this. It was about 70 beats per minute. And then let's see what happened after my subject held their breath. So we're going to just move the cursor to after they held their breath. And I'm gonna try and get this to 15.6 seconds. There we go. And heart rate went down to 69 beats per minute. I have a feeling that if we did some statistical analysis on these numbers, 71, 70, and 69, that that's not really probably statistically significant to say that short-term holding the breath affects heart rate. But this is a repeatable experiment. So if you have your entire class doing this same experiment and you tell your students to try and hold their breath for 20 seconds, you can then get some data and maybe see if there is actually a statistically significant event. Otherwise, it's just interesting and fun to gather this data. So remember, you can get information from each of your graphs by manipulating the display time with your cursors and your double display time, half display time icons or your zoom between cursors. So let's just zoom in again. We'll auto scale to make everything look good. 
And then remember, amplitude would be from the peak of one wave to the trough of the same wave. And remember, right and left arrow keys will allow me to get exactly on the peaks. And I'm actually going to half this display time a little bit more because it will make it a lot easier for me to move my cursors. So amplitude from peak to trough. And that we would read V2 minus V1. If I want to read heart rate, I would be reading heart rate from my heart rate graph. And I have the ability, which is very interesting, to measure time across two graphs. So I can look at something called the R pulse interval. And that would only be time because Y axis information wouldn't make sense from one graph to another. But I could definitely measure the duration from here to here. And that would give me the length of time or the duration it took from the time of my heartbeat to the pulse in my fingertip, which is where the pulse sensor is. So we have talked about the record and stop buttons. Your mountain peaks, which allow you to adjust your display time, your display time option, the auto scale button, our mark feature, and how to gather data. So that brings us to a whole bunch of other icons. And I'm actually gonna start over here because these icons are pretty self-explanatory. The double bridges are your default two cursors, which allows you to measure the amplitude differences, time differences, means between the cursors, etc. You can also switch to single cursor mode. Single cursor mode allows you to get an exact value at an exact point in time. So if I want to know exactly what my heart rate it was, at 57.522 seconds into the recording, I'm reading time and heart rate at that precise point in time. We generally don't need to use single cursor mode, two cursor suffices, but if there's ever a time you need to use single cursor mode, it would be in the directions in the lab. Okay, that brings me to this green letter M. So we're gonna start working from the left over to the right. The green letter M signals the fact that you are on the main screen. The main screen is very easy to understand. It's the screen that you're on that is going to allow you to collect all of your data and you are going to see mathematical values down the right hand margin. The icon next to the main window icon is your analysis icon. This allows you to go to a, another screen, which looks very similar to the screen that you were just on. And it allows you to gather additional mathematical information besides amplitude, means, time, max, etc. If you were in a lab that asked you to go to the analysis window, your mathematical functions would already be added for you. This lab, you can get all the mathematical functions you need right from the main screen. However, let's look and see how easy it is to add them. So I can add V2 minus V1. I can add T2 minus T1. I can add mean, which are all of the same pieces of information that I can get from the main screen. But you will notice if you click add function that there are a lot more calculations that I can do from my data, like root mean squared if you are doing an EMG, standard deviation if you want to know what the standard deviation is, you can do derivative values. Integral values are especially important for EMG data. So when you're doing an EMG recording, getting your mathematical numbers will require you to go into the analysis window. 
adding them is just as easy as clicking add function and adding whatever parameter you want. In this case, I'm going to add a max minus min just because we can. You can also delete them very easily. Click on the one that you don't want and click delete. So I deleted that max minus min because I really don't need it. Now I've got this nice table of data and I can manipulate my cursors and put them in certain spaces. So in this case, I'm gonna go from P to T and I am concerned about my mean heart rate and I want to build a data table. You can open up your journal, which is the notebook icon and go to table. This is where I can take my data that I see here and put it into the journal. There are two ways to do this depending on what data I want in the journal. One is to go into the tools menu and this allows me to add my title to the journal and all of my data to the journal and an image to the journal. The image goes in the editor and will be underneath the questions. And I can delete this also, just highlight it and delete it if you don't want it there. So again, tools allows you to add title, all data and image to the journal. But what happens if I only want information from one graph? If that's the case, you can right click or use the down arrow and I'm in the heart rate graph. I'm gonna add the title to the journal. And now I'm going to add just the channel data. So this is gonna give me the heart rate for this P to T cycle. So now I'm gonna move my cursors to my next P to T and I'm gonna do the same thing and add the data to the journal. And I'm gonna do the next one. And as you can see, it's very easy. All I'm doing is moving the cursors and placing them where I want and clicking add data to journal. Right click, add channel data to journal. So I've built a data table and I can um, delete some rows. So I'm actually going to delete all of this information because I don't want the information for all my graphs. So I'm going to delete those selected rows. So now this is the data table from me doing my P to T waves. There are a couple of things I can do with this data table. One is I can highlight the data table, right click it, and export it to Excel, I can copy it to the editor. And once you copy it to the editor, you will have a nice data table that goes along with the questions and answers from your students. And the last thing I can do with this is I can copy the selection and paste it into Word even if I wanted to. You can also do that with the editor. You can copy these questions and paste them right into Word. If you decide you want your students to answer the questions that are in the journal in the journal, once they do that, they can print the journal with their answers, their data table, the image of their data. All of this goes in the journal and it's a very powerful feature. When you are done, you can close the journal and we can go back to the main screen to begin any additional recording we would like to begin. So we have talked about our file icons, our main window and analysis icon. You will probably not be using the FFT or XY plots. These are more for researchers. There is only one lab that uses the FFT screen. I'll show you what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Um, and if you decide that you are going to use it, it shows up 
correctly with the graphs for power and frequency. Like I said, there is only one lab that uses the FFT function. So if your students or you accidentally select that button, just click the letter M to bring you back to your main window. The XY plot is graph versus graph, not graph versus time. So it would be a plot of ECG against pulse or ECG against heart rate, but not heart rate against time. So that's got very limited use for a teaching laboratory. We've discussed the journal feature. Again, this is your notebook and anything that you put in the journal when you click save, saves as part of your data file. The other thing is this meter feature. Um, your meter is based on what you've got showing in the right hand column. So if I click meter, it will show me the values from my right hand column. And I don't have my heart rate meter set correctly, so it's slightly different. Um, you can set the meters in edit preferences. The only time I have ever used the meter feature is when I've had a student who is um, visually impaired. So this is not a feature you are going to use a lot, but it is available if you'd like. It is an on off button. Click it once to turn it on. Click it again to turn it off. The next icon is your pencil icon. This is the feature that allows you to do marks. Okay, now remember we did marks by um, typing into our mark space and clicking the mark button while we were recording. The pencil is your mark manager. So if I click the pencil icon, here are the marks that I have made. I can highlight a mark and go to that mark there, or I can use the down arrow and go to that mark from the down arrow. I can highlight a mark and delete it. It will not delete unless you tell it to. So I'm gonna say no, because I don't want to delete that mark. The other thing that I can do is I can highlight the mark and I can, rather than saying breathe normally, let's say I want to go and say um, breathing normally. So I would just type it in, click out, click OK, and check, oh, it doesn't say breathe normally anymore. Now it says breathing normally. So again, navigating your marks are very easy. The other thing that you can do is if you know what marks you want to make during your recording is you can do preset marks. And these marks would be associated with your function keys. So I'm gonna type in a word that's a pretty hard to spell and type quickly while you are doing your frog nerve and you wanna drop one drop of acetylcholine. So I'm gonna add that. And now I'm going to change this to two drops and add and three drops and add. And I'll throw a saline in here as well and add. So notice these are all associated with my functions. And now if I click OK and I click record, so I'm going to start a recording again. And now I'm going to click the function key on my keyboard. And you'll notice I didn't type anything in the mark box, but it says acetylcholine one drop. And I can click F2, F3, F4. And it's making all my preset marks for me. And if I, oh. I clicked F5, but there's nothing associated with F5. So I can stop my recording. I can go into my mark manager. And this is where I may want to either delete my mark or edit my mark, but I'll just show you how to delete it. Yes, I'm sure, click okay. And then that F5 mark goes away. Remember to always save your data. 
So that is all of the icons except this histogram and my letter M. For that, I need to go to a different location so I can explain. So bear with me while I get back to this specific hardware so I can open up a lab that uses the histogram. Our histogram is our control panel for our stimulator. On the IXTA box, you have a built-in stimulator and that acts like a TENS unit. The histogram is the way that you control your stimulator. If you open up the lab and the stimulator control panel, this stimulator control panel right here with all the numbers does not open automatically, just click the histogram and it will open. You will also notice that I have this pinkish channel now, a pink graph, and it says stimulus trigger record, not record. This is a record of every time the stimulator fires. The directions for using the stimulator would be included in the labs that use it. The last one I wanna show you is the funny little M over here. This is my macro feature. And macros are basically pre-programmed specific things that we want to happen while you are collecting data. So while I would be collecting data for this Erickson flanker test, if I click the Erickson Flanker macro and click record, it will actually show me different images that I'm supposed to react to automatically. It's not something that you have to do. You can build your own macros, but that is an advanced feature. And there is a set of directions here called Experiment Builder. It is under Human Psychology Testing for building your own macros for specific experiments. All of the human psychology tests have their own macro because they all have very specific testing parameters. There are a few other labs that use macros, but primarily it's the psychological testing ones. So we have learned how to collect data after opening a lab from our settings file, getting the sets of directions that we need from the experiment tab and using our icons. We've got videos online on our website, again, www.iworks.com. You can just click teaching and there will be lab scribe videos or support and videos are under there as well. I hope this has helped you. And if you've got any questions or need any assistance at all, you can email support at iWorks.com. That's S-U-P-P-O-R-T at iWorks, I-W-O-R-X.com or call support at 603-617-2575. Again, that's 603-617-2575. And someone will be happy to help you. Thank you.